Okay. Okay, we're all. Hi, this is Randy Wicker. We've just seen uh, Mar uh, Mark Rubin's memorial, and I'm running into old activists from the Gay Activist Alliance. And one of the really outstanding ones who, who uh, I'll want to develop exactly the, what happened with him in the Gay Activist Alliance, your name is? Alan Roscoff. And uh, I always remember you as not only one of the key people in GAA, but one of the people that went down and began lobbying the city councilman downtown? You know, what happened is Mark Rubin chaired the Municipal Government Committee, and within a few weeks, um, he handed the committee over to me, and um, I quickly learned. And um, I was with Mark when we, for Bill was first being written, and I had a hand in that. And then I just became the chief lobbyist, and it just kept on going and going and going. When I actually use you as a description of when I, my description of the movement, are these bright young men went down to City Hall and began talking to these uh, city councilmen, and they weren't dummies. They might be lousy politicians, but they weren't dummies. And they saw these young, articulate, bright guys. And next thing you knew, the gay activists like yourself were suddenly get becoming employees of the of the city government and the councilmen or whatever. Well, tell me your progression on that. Well. I became active in the Americans for Democratic Action, and I had been lobbying for the bill for a number of years. I got arrested a number of times, and for some reason I got involved in Democratic Party politics. Jim Owls was the first president of the gay activists, of um, gay, gay independent Democrats. Who also, by the way, ran for city council, yes. and before that, Carol Greitzer ignored us, said she didn't understand our concerns, and he surprisingly got just as a gay activist, I forget, only 10 or 12, but a significant percent of the vote for someone that supposedly would get none. It was unheard of, a gay person running. He was the first candidate in the entire country. And Carol Greitzer totally ignored the community. In fact, she criticized people who agreed to sponsor the bill, saying, you know, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Why are you bothering with them? Um, Jay Golden called me in one day and said, you know, I want to have a greater role in the gay community. I want to be helpful with the community. I want to know to get the community, get to know them better. And who was Jay Golden? Jay Golden was a city controller, one of the three citywide elected officials. And he said, do you have anybody in mind that would like to serve on my executive staff? I had just been fired from two schools because they found that I was gay and I was without a job. I said, Jay, I think I have the perfect person for you. And I was Nothing a, like recommending yourself. I was the first openly gay person um, to work for a government official, um, nonetheless a um, citywide official. And I served on his executive staff and I was at every meeting of the Board of Estimate and executive meeting. And when I was sitting in for the controller at a Board of Estimate meeting, I remember my friend Bob came to see me. He had to give me something. And he leaned over and he gave me a kiss hello. And, you know, things like that. When the Chelsea gym um, was going for variance and they were going to be the first gay gym in the, I think, the country, I remember leaning over to the then borough president of Queens, whose vote we needed, and said, you know, Claire, this is very important to me. This is going to be basically a gay gym. So, And she says, okay, you can have my vote. So a lot of good was done because I, I was there. Jay Goldman um, came before the greater... Greater Gotham Business Council, and I wrote a speech for him, which he didn't read beforehand, and um, he gave talking about how um, New York City should be open to gay people from throughout the country and th throughout the world, and we should welcome lesbians and gays with open arms. So the next day, the um, New York Post had a cartoon of the Statue of Liberty cross-eyed holding the Gotham's Gay Guide to New York. So we did some groundbreaking work back then. I want to go fast forward because, uh, I, as I recall, you continued to rise. You were ended up being president of, of, I forget, ADA, or I know you ended up being Mark Green's special or chief of staff. Am no, I not wrong? chief of staff, but I was on his executive staff for eight years. Right. And I, he nearly, except for just a fluke, he nearly became the mayor of the city of New York. I, yes, I said, Mark, when you become mayor, I want to be police commissioner. I don't think that would have happened, but we were that close. After I left um, the city controller's office, I worked for Governor Cuomo, 
and then I went to David Dinkins and then to Mark Green for eight years. Mark is my brother. We're very, very close. Still are. Now he's heading um, um, Air America. And then I went to the state senate. I worked... These are all straight men who just took you as a gay employee and gave you a career in government and you proved your mettle by doing the job well and continuing well, to rise through the ranks. Some of, the, some of them hired gay people because they wanted to advance the cause and like Mark Green, and some of them hired gay people because they wanted our votes. So it was. Well, a that's what bad. politician is. Politicians are, are whores. They're all, all they're all uh, prostitutes of one sort or another. They'll do anything for a vote. See, Mark, uh, Mark Rubin um, would not get involved with the political establishment, mm -hmm. and because he kind of knew that it wasn't revolutionary. It wasn't, you know. I don't know how it happened with me, but it did. So where are you today? What is the result today? Mark Green unfortunately lost his bid, and are you, what did you have, employment now in government, or are you what? I retired a year ago, um, June. I was working for Senator Tom Dwayne. With a nice big fat pension, I hope, at the a government. Nice, nice pension, tier one, because I started working for the city in um, 1972. So, uh, and now I'm doing private consulting, and um, a lot of it has to both. Three quarters of it has to do with um, working with the gay community and using my um, my expertise and my knowledge. Listen to on. this corporate sellout, folks. This guy used to be a revolutionary. I now, never got now paid for my gay work. Never. He just cashed in on another way. See, he never got paid for his gay no, work, no, no, but no. he just went on for a, for a 40 year, 30 year career in city government working for the top officials in the country, holding top jobs, and now retired with a nice, big, fat government let pension. Me, let me tell you something. <laughs> that if I didn't come out of I'm the closet, if I didn't come out of the closet, and I wasn't so left, and I wasn't so outspoken. I would have done a lot better professionally. What held me back basically was my being so progressive and so outspoken. Um, a lot of elected officials felt that they could not control me. There are now the lesbian and gay power structure are out there solely to promote their mail, meal ticket solely to promote candidates like Hillary Clinton, who say she's against marriage on moral, religious, and traditional grounds. Now we're and, getting back to the activism, folks. Well, I've always been an activist. And, you know, I was at a meeting several weeks ago with Chuck Schumer. There was 800 people in the audience, and I blasted him for, for saying he's against same-sex marriage. I blasted Hillary a few months ago at a meeting with 40 prominent gay leaders. I said, every time you say you're against the right to marry, that's like sticking a knife in our hearts. I haven't changed. I was I was giving you a hard time okay. because I knew you were up to answering the challenge. I want the little legacy for <laughs> never selling out. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, I always said about Hillary Clinton when I was a cloning activist, I just wish someone would give her a warm gene because the woman is just so, I mean, I don't want hers, but kind of because I think she's so cold and she's not electable, just the way I thought John Kerry wasn't electable. You know, I don't hold her personality against her. I hold her positions. I hold that she has not embraced us. And it angers me that the Human Rights Campaign Fund, you know, all of them are, are so close to her and raising money and how many so-called stars in our community are funding her. You know what it is, is, is we usually in politics end up voting for the lesser evil. We really, one time I voted in the presidential primary for, with my heart. I voted for Jesse Jackson. Now, I honestly didn't think Jesse was really qualified to be president. He was too idealistic. But he was the only one in that campaign that was saying anything. You want to know something? That was the most satisfying vote in my life. I knew he would never get the nomination. It could depend on the biggest in America to stop him. But it made me feel so good for once to vote for the guy I really thought spoke the best and really raised the issues. And I voted with my heart. And to this day, I can honestly say that is the proudest vote I ever cast in my life. Two things. One, I headed lesbian and gays for Jackson in New York State. And we had a rally outside mm -hmm. with a flatbed truck with Jesse, mm -hmm. and the entire block was full of members of our community. And I, one of the warmest and most rememberable moments of my life, mm -hmm. Jesse was up there with prominent members of the gay community and a lot of elected officials, Congress members, Charlie Rangel, Floyd Flake, and so on and so forth. And the sun was going down, and he asked people with AIDS to please come up on stage.
My lover said, I, I was telling the Al Gore said, you know, people think, put your hand on, people think that you can catch AIDS from shaking a person's hand. And my lover David said, you know what I saw Jesse Jackson do? Hug somebody with AIDS. He hugged them all. And back then, Jesse, you know, I went to the convention and I cried when he gave his speech. You know, I have that speech on DVD and I'm going to give you a copy. I've had it on VHS tape and I ran into a guy of African-American descent. I said, you know, I have Jesse Jackson's 1988 speech and I felt a, a Caucasian guy, I forget who it was, said, you know, I remember that speech as the last really important, moving, sincere political speech I've heard in American politics. The 1988 speech Jesse Jackson gave at the Democratic Convention. He got off the stage and he walked around the entire convention floor. He talked about patches and the gay and lesbian patches not enough and the women's patch, the teachers, you're on down the line. Yeah, he was, that was, the other person that I idolized um, the most was Bella Abzug. And she was the first campaign I ever got involved with because I was driving a cab and when I was about 18 years old, I almost ran her down. So she came over to Cab and said, you don't have a Bella button in your cab. No, you don't have a Bella button in your cab. And she gave me the button, and I just fell in love with everything that she stood for. And she was like our mother. Right, and, and you know what I remember vividly? That when the cops started coming along and telling kids that we're innocently sitting on Christopher Street around the Oscar Wilde bookstores, I mean, okay, kids, move it along. Bella Abzug called the cops and said, quit harassing people in the neighborhood for simply hanging out in their community. Bella was, I was in Dade County um, with the Anita Bryant campaign working against her, obviously. And the night uh, of our defeat, um, I understand hundreds of gay people marched from Sheridan Square to Bella's home. And one thing about that was so interesting is Carol Greiser got up, and because some people in the community remember her being anti-gay, started to say, it's Carol Greiser, shh. And I said, shut up. Because she was saying, this is not, you know, Florida. This is not going to happen here in New York and other... I said, look, she's saying the right things. Now when a politician says the right things, you give them applause, you stop hissing. But we don't forget to. We don't forget if every member of the council was like Carol Greitzer, we never would have gotten a gay rights bill. We would have had to be fighting just to get the bill introduced. But we had Eldon Klingon, Carter Burden, Ted Weiss, and Leonard Skolnick from Brooklyn. Those were the four people who um, introduced our bill, and and that was the four that um, that were on the original bill that put it in, and were the leaders um, among straight elected officials. I don't want to make too long a tape here. What would be your advice to young people considering a career working in government the way you have? Well, let me tell you, if I'm offered another government job, I'll turn it down. I don't care what it is. Um, but if you could, if you feel you can make a difference and you want to join, it's like any other profession. It's all a rat race. And the problem is there are no more Bella Abzugs. There are no more Jesse Jackson. There are only lesser evils. <laughs> There's only lesser evils. And the Democrats of today are probably to the right of the, of the New York Republicans of 30 years ago. Charles Goodell, who was a Republican senator in the 30 years ago, was fighting against the Vietnam War, was great on civil rights, and would not have voted for um, to fund the Iraq War, I believe. You're talking to a man who was a Republican for 12 years. Oh, no. I never and voted then, Republican. And then, no, only for Gerald Ford, because I thought that Carter was the Christian rights first candidate. He was, but he didn't do what they wanted. But say that that I was a John B. Anderson Republican, and then there's no good Republicans left today. Well, I've never voted Republican, and I never will, but my only point is the Democrats are becoming the Republicans of yesterday. There's little difference among so many of them, and just because they have the ability to give lobbyists money and to fund institutions and to come to our dinners does not make them vote worthy for those of us who are involved in the struggle for gay rights and gay liberation and to end the war and to stop poverty. I have never sold out and I'm proud of that. I'm proud of you for that too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Alan Oscar, a really rare, great interview. Thank you. Thank you.